Well, welcome to Word Time. This is Coach Shelby with Coach for Christ, and I'm going to be talking about our calling today. You know, that's a broad uh, topic, but it really narrows down to one thing. We are called to be children of God. We're called to be conformed into the likeness of Yeshua the Christ, the second Adam. For the first Adam failed uh, when the temptation from the enemy came. However, um, we have been called into a new nature by faith and trust in Jesus Christ, the second Adam, who came to do what the first Adam could not do. And so our calling um, today will be coming out of you the, out of the book of 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, and I'm going to start in uh, verse 1, and I'm just going to kind of go through here and break this down um, as, as I see it. Um, this was actually on my heart yesterday morning as I was praying uh, for many of you and for my family, um, and I, a lot of times I feel like that I need to go with it immediately when it's hot, you know, when the bread comes out of the oven when it's hot. And it's not that the word of God ever goes cold, but there is a timing in all things. And sometimes I wish I just had time that when these uh, words were just uh, on fire, if you will, as they come out of the oven that um, I would share immediately, um, not for, you know, for my benefit. We enjoyed that benefit here. We, we had fresh manna, fresh bread, but it's kind of like sometimes I feel like you guys get the leftovers and it's not quite the same the day after. But nevertheless, let the word of God speak to you and let the word of God uh, um, do what the word of God does in your life. Now, this letter uh, by Peter, as we know to be written by Peter, is basically you can take this to the body of Christ. Of course, it was written to one of the places over in Asia, but it is the body of Christ and it, it is a general letter to us and how to conduct ourselves and and how to, to live out our calling, if you will. And that's just what comes to my mind. We could come up with a thousand different titles. In verse two, it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Now, we know that grace is defined by the local church as undeserved favor. We understand that. But if you went a little bit deeper and you you went to the book of Titus, just taking that first word, grace, and the book of Titus tells us that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. That right there is a whole mouthful, uh, yet a whole heartful. That kind of debunks the theory of just basically saying, I'm going to get undeserved favor. God's going to give me favor that I did not deserve. Um, and I could come up with a lot of words there, but I'm trying to keep this lesson to the point of what I'm talking about. But grace is an understanding, okay? It is an understanding that God's word, who is his son that became flesh, that Yeshua seated on the throne of the born again believer's heart, the government of God in your life. And you also have to understand this, grace and peace. So let's put those two together. The Lord will give you peace that passes all understanding. I think it's Philippians 4 and 6 that says, make your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will encompass your heart and your mind. And I'm pointing here, but I'm really talking about the peace that's within your spirit, the born again man. So grace, unmerited favor, the government of God in you, the rule of God, and peace, peace that is not a worldly peace, um, because if you look at the world, you go, there is no peace. And many people say, well, God is a God of peace. But you got to understand that God came, Yeshua the Christ, the word became flesh to bring you peace with God, that the wrath of God would not be taken out upon you. That's what peace is. Not peace with the world, peace with God. Because our whole life was anti-God, anti-Christ. Therefore, grace and peace Grace is the understanding of the government, the rule of God in your life, according to the word of God of in your life, according to the King of kings and Lord of lords that rules on the throne of your life. Now, many people, and I do think rightly so, are waiting for the opposite of this, the Antichrist, to sit upon the throne on the temple mound and proclaim himself as God, thinking that they will notice the works of the devil according to what the Bible explains will happen, but what they do not realize is that this is also a type and a shadow as well as as well as something that will happen that 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 the enemy is already setting up on the thrones of men's heart. If you have not watched um, some of the the governmental stuff, and I'm not uh, you know saying to, to watch it, I'm saying pray for them. But some of the stupidity and the demonic agendas 
and the senselessness of not even being able to answer a question. There's no wisdom. There's no knowledge. There's no understanding. The, these leaders have been heaped up upon a, 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 a nation who has chosen to forget God. They chose to honor God with their lips to go to Sunday service. They chose to put a dollar in the offering plate to do something just to try to secure the eternal destination in heaven, but they have no desire to live under the rule of heaven, which is the government of God in our lives, which is the grace and peace with God that only comes through his son and his rule in our lives. Grace and peace be multiplied. I like that word multiplied unto you through the knowledge of of God. How? Through the knowledge of God. Knowledge. I want you to look, take the first part of that word and to know God. The Bible tells us in John 17, 3, that eternal life is to know God. Let me read that to you. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. To know God. And so multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. So the grace and peace is multiplied unto you. The government of God becomes reality in your life because you know God. You spent time with God. God is seated upon the throne of your heart. The, the knowledge of God, intimacy with the Lord and of Jesus our Lord. So we understand that, that grace teaches us to deny ungodliness. The peace that passes all understanding gives us peace with God, not with a world that is opposed to God. Certainly not with a world that Ephesians 2 says that Satan is the God of this world. How can we have peace with such things? We have peace with God. And because of this in our allegiance and where we stand, it is multiplied unto us through the knowledge, through the intimacy, through knowing God. Does that make sense to anybody? And in verse 3, I want to go on with this. It says, according as his divine nature hath given to us all things that pertain to eternal life and godliness through the knowledge of him, there's that word again, that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now to the divine nature, the divine nature of God, the, we've escaped the lust of this world because of the divine nature of God. The divine nature of God is the Holy Spirit. And the divine nature of God, it comes upon that one who believes in the finished work of the cross, the deity of Christ, his resurrection from the dead. And they believe the words, the totality of his words that said, if you would ask, even according to Luke chapter 11 for the Holy Spirit, that I will send you the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you. Sounds a little bit guide like government in your life, the rule of God in your life. So you're not going to go to heaven. There's many people that think that they're going to go to heaven because they profess Jesus as Lord, but they have no desire for who he is. They profess him in his title, but they don't know him, nor do they desire to know him. Because when you move into God's place, or let me turn it around, when God moves into your house and begins to rule from the throne of your heart, as Satan is doing in many, when that happens, you no longer get to do what you want to do. You don't roll your own. You don't make your own decisions. Those that are sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. They're not leading God. God is leading them. And we know this according to the Word of God. So according as his divine nature, his Holy Spirit, that has come inside that one who's repented and put his trust in Yeshua the Christ, and then he does what Jesus says. He has a, a life of, of asking, seeking, knocking, and continuing to find the presence of God in his life, continuing to spend that time in the presence of God. And according as his divine power hath given us all things that pertain unto life, his divine power, his, his divine power, virtue, healing power, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, has given us all things that pertain unto eternal life, given us all things that pertain unto eternal life and godliness through the knowledge of him who hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, through the knowledge of him, he's given us eternal life, the knowledge of him, the knowledge of him. He is the word of God. Let me say it again. All things that pertain unto life and God is through the knowledge unto life. He has given us all things that pertain unto life, eternal life. You see, this is the pervert that comes in and turns this into a materialistic blessing. 
that God desires you to have things. No, God desires for you to have him. Let me say that again. God does not desire for you to have things. God desires for you to have him. That's what it means to know God. That's what it means when it says, according as his divine power, his spirit, his rule, his government, his grace in your life, the peace that passes all understanding because it makes no sense in this world. His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life. He's given us all things that pertain unto life. He has given us what we need, even his son, Jesus Christ. He has given us the Holy Spirit. He has given us the word who is Jesus Christ. He has given us all these things that, that help us to pertain unto life and godliness through intimacy, through knowing him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now, the word glory brings to my attention reputation, honor, and absolute perfection. Well, we know who that points to. But we are to imitate him. And we are to be changed, 2 Corinthians 3.18, into his image, into his moral likeness from glory to glory. So the word for glory brings up the word reputation. What is your reputa reputation, brother? What is the reputation of the one you claim to serve? Does anyone even know the reputation of the one that you serve? And has his reputation gotten on you? Has it bestowed the honor of God, to honor God, to fear God? A wise man fears God. Does, does his reputation on you as the absolute perfect one, the glorious King of kings and Lord of lords, does this govern your life in every facet of your being? Because I'm going to tell you this, that if you turn your back on God when tragedy comes, and it will come, and has come, and will come again, then you never understood who God was, nor did you ever know God. You see, I find it amazing when people say, well, I lost a loved one and uh, I used to go to church all the time and now I don't want nothing to do with church because God took them. You see, there's the evidence they didn't know God because God is the one that said is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment of God. It is, it is God who said to dust thou art and dust you will return. Why is it a shock and a surprise when someone does exactly what God said they would do, yet you claim you believe the deity of Christ, but you believe not any word that he has spoken. So unto life and godliness, the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Now virtue, what is the word for virtue? The word for virtue is ad, eh, I don't want to take that, minister. The word that comes to mind is minister, servant virtue, power, okay? So to, to, to sparing no expense, power, action, virtue. You see that the, there's a flowing of the one that is filled with the Holy Spirit of glory and of virtue. To minister, to serve, to virtue, the power to serve, the power to present the word of God, the, the, the power to take action. You see, because if there was no power there, then that's because there's no faith there. The releasing of faith brings power, whereby in verse four are, are given unto us exceeding and great, exceed, I'm sorry, exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. I said that you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust, let's do it again, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. You might be partakers of the spirit of God, as I've already alluded to and already spoke on. I believe it's 1 Corinthians 2 and 14 that says the natural man understandeth not the things of God because he's spiritually discerned. He has not the Holy Spirit, so he cannot understand. So don't be, don't marvel when you run into someone and you preach the gospel and they don't listen. They're dead. They don't understand. And so the Bible says that wherever I'm at here says in verse four, partakers of the divine nature, partakers of the Holy Spirit, they have escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. The only way to escape the corruption that is in the world through lust is to be led out by the Holy Spirit and to be led by. 
It does not mean that you'll be absent from the world, but you're not a part of the world. You are not of this world. For your kingdom is another kingdom, even the kingdom of God. For the Bible says, and and that that Yeshua said, I believe it's in uh, Luke seventeen twenty one, somewhere in there. Uh, don't quote me. Look it up. Google it. That that the kingdom of God is within you. The rule and government of God is within you. It's not in this world that you're looking at these beautiful mountains and the streets and all that and all the evil corruption. That Satan is the prince of the power of the air. It's not there. It's within you. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. So these exceeding and great precious promises that we may be partakers of the divine nature of the spirit of the living God. And through this and through this and the faith, the same faith that brought us to the cross of Calvary to repent is the same faith that's going to take us to pick up our cross. Well, deny ourselves, pick up our cross and follow Jesus daily. This is how we escape the corruption that is in the world through lust. It is not that it is not at our side. Even the book of Psalm 91 says that a thousand shall fall at my side and 10,000 in my right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Now in the English translation, you might say that's pretty close if they're falling at your right hand and your left. That, 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 that would say it's pretty close if, if you've observed that close. However, it can't touch your spirit. Your body is attached to this world, but your spirit is out of this world, even connected to Christ. You know, I like to say this, and I don't know if I can say it right. I preached this one time before, and I said an aerial attack is always better than a ground attack. And an aerial attack, the Bible says that Jesus is seated far above all principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. The Bible says that the, the, the heaven is where his throne is and earth is his footstool. It sounds to me like a heavenly view. It sounds to me like he is far above all of these things, all of these dominions and powers and rulers and all of these things of this world that God is always here. He's near to us always, even a whisper away, but he's also far above these things. And the Bible says that in Colossians, I believe chapter three, it says that I'm seated with Christ in God. Mm. See, a heavenly view is better than an earthly view. And so I'm, if I'm seated with Christ in God, I have a better, I have a spiritual view of the totality of the picture that God has placed me in. No different than the mountain view I'm looking at now. You see, many times we can only see partially. You know, take a, a quarter of this picture, if you will, over here, and you take that part right here. You wouldn't see this road you wouldn't see these clouds. You wouldn't see the other mountain on the other side. You wouldn't see these things. But an aerial view lifts you above it to where you can see what's going on. And it is my God who knows the end from the beginning. And I'm not saying he'll reveal to you every detail because that might remove your need for faith. Hmm. But you trust the one that he's a, he's a good father. And you trust that he has already seen the end from the beginning. And you walk with him through that, knowing that you will never get through unless you're walking with him. Verse five, and besides these, giving all diligence, add to your, uh, give, giving all diligence, add your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. And verse six, and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness. And in verse seven, and to godliness brotherly kindness and brotherly kindness charity. Now, let me, let me go through some of these words for you. Diligence is persistent effort, attention, pursuit, be diligent. That God rewards those in Hebrews 11 that diligently seek him. This is on purpose with your life, lest you be an accident. This is to be persistent and to give that effort on a continual basis. It's not, not moved by what you feel. And I didn't feel like praying. I didn't feel like seeking the Lord this morning. And it's not moved by what we feel. We're moved by what we believe. You don't always feel like going to work, but you go because you expect a paycheck. Mm. How about the things of the spirit? The next word that I brought up was, I brought up the word faith. And I'm, I'm putting all this together, verses five through seven. I brought the word faith, trust. You know, I, 
the, the image that pops in my mind when I think about faith and I think about action and I think about faith leads me to go to work for God. It teaches me to be in the ministry, which means to serve. I think about a chair and how often we walk into a room and we sit in a chair, but no one listening goes and inspects that chair before they sit on it. What if it had a broken leg? You just trust that it doesn't. How much more are the things of God? See, that's faith. When you walk in and you take a seat and you never tested that. It's faith when you jump inside your vehicle and you drive down the road 70 miles an hour in a 3,000 pound piece of steel that could crush and destroy you. It's faith when you don't get out and circle that vehicle and get up underneath it, check all the bolts every time you drive it, make sure a wheel's not going to fall off when you're running 70 miles an hour down the road. Make sure the fuel line's not punctured and leaking, the thing catch on fire and you become a ball of fire going down the road. It, it is by faith. You just trust the people. And I want you to think about that for a second. The trust that we have in our school system that we're going to get a paycheck. Hmm. Most of you have more faith in the world than you do in the word of God. Here's why. Because we're touchy-feely, we're sensual, and we like to see something before we believe it. And our past record tells us that if I go to work, even though they don't pay me in advance, my past record tells me that they're going to pay me when the work is done. What is your past record with God? Are you truly saved? Because if your past record tells you that he saved you and washed you in the blood and you repented, then why are you not obeying the rest of his word, knowing that that's as true as that one? Because he is the totality of the word of God. Virtue. I like it when I looked it up in Strong's, the one of the words that popped out to me, manliness, virtue, moral goodness, virtue. I, again, the word power comes to my mind, manliness, act like men, how? Have moral goodness by imitating the Lord Yeshua, the Christ, and yet not even just imitating, imitating yet following the Spirit of God. Children obey their fathers and imitate their mothers and fathers when their mothers and fathers are around, even your language even the way you do things. That's a type and a shadow of how we're to follow God into all moral goodness. The next word was knowledge. And I put down the word that pops in my mind to simply knowing the word, who is a person, Jesus Christ. Knowledge, knowledge, to know God, to be intimate with God. You see, there's a there's a difference between walking and knowing someone, knowing their name and what they look like, then knowing their heart and what they're all about. There's a difference in being intimate. There's a difference in time spent with that person in intimacy than a person you just spend time with in class every day. And some of you have a classroom experience with God, but you have no intimate time with God. You have no one-on-one -on -one time with God. You never show up to the, the, the meeting that is just for you and God. You only show up to the meeting where there's a multitude of others there with you. So where's your faith really at? Temperance, self-control. As men and women of God, by the Holy Spirit, we are to have self-control. <clears throat> and believe me, that will be tested, especially this football season. Patience. The word that comes to mind for patience is endurance. The Bible says without endurance that no man will make it. Jesus said it this way, I believe it's in Matthew 24, that the man who endures to the end shall be saved. I know y'all know about endurance. When you're having a hard time making it, your legs are hurting, your breath and your lungs are coming out your mouth. You understand a little bit about endurance, but the Bible demands endurance. In other words, it might be painful at times, but keep pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Keep on keeping on. Brotherly kindness. The Bible talks about in John 17. It says that Jesus was praying to the Father, and he says that they, that would be you and I, brothers and sisters that are believers, would be one as the Father and Yeshua are one. And then we would be one in them. How can that be possible? Only through the Holy Spirit. 
only through the Holy Spirit. And then the last word I brought up um, out of that text of verses five through seven is charity, which means love. Now, I want to say this about love. Love is not always deemed as loved by those who are weak spirited. The natural man is weak. The natural man tries to find all kinds of accolades and things in this world to bring attention to himself because there is no gratification or fulfillment in the spirit. He's weak spirited. He's not connected to the spirit of God. And this describes many that go to the gatherings. And I don't like to say this, but it's the truth. It's the truth. We've reduced down uh, the love for God as to love the benefits of God, but not to love the person of God. What are the benefits? And there are benefits. There are benefits. He is health to our flesh and strength to our bones. He is who he is. He will prosper us even as our soul prospers. There are many benefits to God. God's not a, 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 a derelict father. He's not a slacking father. He's not a, a father that doesn't pay attention to details. He's not a father who allows things to slide under the rug or to be swept under the rug. But the love of God compels us to preach the gospel. And I made a statement this week, and I heard this, man. For those of you who made it this long or the faithful, so I know I can say this now. Actually, it wasn't brought to my attention until just now. I wouldn't really care either way. But I was driving down the road, and I see for years, not just in my community, but in, especially in other communities, I was down in a place called Waxahachie, and um, I've been to a lot of places, and I'm just bringing up names, not not I have any place in mind. But when we see these building constructions going on and the building funds constantly, even in the midst of the, the highest inflation rate we've ever had. And if you guys don't pay attention when you vote, I'm going to say it. You ain't seen nothing yet. You better go for an American that has a plan to help you there. Without repentance, our nation won't be saved. However, in the meantime, you might have enough money to eat. And I'm just going to leave it right there. Okay. So that charity love is not always received as love by weak spirited men. And as I was driving, as I was saying, hadn't forgotten what I was talking about. I see all these building funds and these beautiful, fancy buildings. And I see all these, these churches, if you will, that have two or three services on Sunday. And that's excellent. Great. Maybe. But the thought that popped in my mind, maybe it's just me early morning, maybe it's the spirit of God said that would we need bigger buildings if the true gospel was being preached? Would we? Why don't you try it? That's the only way to answer this. I'll tell you what, our church turns over about every couple of months. What does that mean? There are people that have been there that have been faithful for years, but the ones who decided they're not going to be faithful, who don't want to hear the message of the blood and the cross through repentance, which is the only way you can be saved and born again. And I'm not talking about a one-time come to the altar deal forever. I'm talking about daily repentance, being led by the spirit out of those things that are pulling you away from the spirit of God. If, if, if that's not being preached, then you have a false gospel. It says, I've said last week, you're eating your dessert before you eat your nutrients. You're going to be malnutrition. You may be bigger than a good year blimp, but you're going to be malnutrition. You're going to swell up, but that ain't, that's not nutritious. That's not healthy. And so would we need more buildings if we were preaching repentance, the blood and the cross? and teaching the Holy Spirit's desire to lead us and our obedience to him. Would we? Probably not. And Jesus, I'm just sitting here, came into my mind, I was sitting here listening. And the woman at the well, she said that you Jews worship in the temple and we worship here on this mountain. And she's talking to the Lord. And he said, woman, there's a time coming that, that, uh, Man will neither worship there or here, but God is spirit and he will worship, be worshiped in spirit and in truth. We're in that day. We're in that day for some. 
Some are still de depending on the building fund and they love the light shows and the smoke shows and all that. But what if we take all of that out and we just preach the word of God? The way God preached it, the way the apostles preached it. Repentance, the blood, the cross. What if? I think it's pretty safe to say in this nation, there'd be no need for another building. Am I saying that I am 100% right in every case across the world? No, I'm not. I'm just saying the multitude. We're building buildings, but we have not built the foundation. We have not poured the foundation into their lives. We have not spoken of repentance. We've not addressed sin. We've not addressed our need for holiness. We have, not, we have not addressed sanctification to separate, come out from among the world. Though we are in the world, we are with God going through the world, and we don't, we don't deviate from the word of God. We haven't done that. So until we've done that, then I'm going to tell you, people are going to be held accountable for what they've done with God's money because they've done nothing for God. God said, you honor me with your lips, you honor me with your buildings, you honor me, you put your tithes and offerings in there, you fast, but it's all for a show, for a pretense. It's all for you. If there just happened to be a pastor that would see this, I challenge you, go into service Sunday morning and you preach repentance and you address sin. Why? Because it needs to be cut out and it's cut out at the cross of Christ. It's cut out when they come and they repent and we're open before God and we're honest before God about what we are and what we have done and our great need for his blood to wash and cleanse us. And we lay there in his presence until he says, now get up, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. I pray this message been a blessing to you. I know it was a blessing to me yesterday and I don't think, again, I articulated it the exact way that it came across yesterday when I was on fire, uh, but it's still true today. And I pray that, that God will minister this unto you. And I pray that you have a blessed day. And I pray that you guys uh, uh, will, will take to heed, to heart, Second Peter chapter 1 this morning. In Jesus' mighty, mighty 